Hey, everybody. We want to welcome you to this week's edition of the Get Your Geek On podcast. We are your hosts, as always, Charles Keywatts. Robert Dokes. Anthony Arsenio. And as always, we are bringing you the best and latest geek news of the week. And starting off the show on a hot note with a fresh casting call just hitting the interwebs today. And that is the Thor Ragnarok cast officially unveiled by Marvel. Some rumors were confirmed. Some surprises were thrown out there. And we're going to delve right into it. Uh, confirmed in the cast was Mark Ruffalo playing the Hulk, as we had all thought, as well as Kate Blanchett playing the villainous Helena. But uh, two surprises thrown into the cast today were Jeff Goldblum. Which you who, called. who we reported here last week was inches away from signing a contract in a Marvel movie in the role of Grandmaster and kind of a shock with Carl Urban being cast as the villainous Scourge. I'm not going to say that Carl Urban is a shock. He's done dread really, dread really well. He's done a lot of these roles. I'm not surprised that he actually got the chance to do this. Now, Man, Robert, a, you're a resident a Marvel actor. nut here. So what do you guys know about Grandmaster and Scourge? I'm pretty new to the characters. Is there anything that you guys can tell me? No, no, no. These are kind of traditional Thor, Thor villains um, or Thor people, guys. Thor guys. Thor guys. <laughs> um, I, I'm kind of, I want to see Carl Urban do Scourge. I think that's the more interesting one out of all of this. Jeff Goldblum will probably be very awesome as Grandmaster, and I'm looking forward to that. Carl Urban is Scourge. I'm hoping it's not as going to be as disappointing as... Um, Christopher Eccleston is the Dark Christ Elf. Cr- Christopher Eccleston. And I was that... Because he's, you can see he's done comic book movies before. He's a great character actor. I really want to see how he's going to pull this off, uh, especially because. And I'm also kind of interested in, in to kind of segue into Kate Blanchett as he- Hella or Heel, because um, that's an interesting dynamic. Because technically, she's Loki's daughter in Norse mythology. Yeah. That's, uh, that's gonna be a weird one to see the tap that in. But, I mean, it's just one thing Marvel's not all that close to the Norse mythology. No, it, it, From it, what it, I've seen in their movies, they really don't do it justice. It's advanced science, it's, it's not it's, really magic. It, it's not really advanced science. We, we don't know how they're gonna you know, portray this, but she is, you know, she is a uh, ruler of the underworld. So she's ba- she, isn't she the female version of Hades, basically? Yeah, she's the female version in Norse mythology. She's the female version of Hades. Um, I think it's Helheim, not Helheim. I'm forgetting what it is. Heimdall? No, it's um. I'm trying to name because it's Jotunheim for the giants, Nibelheim for the elves, uh, and she has her own place. Like Nibelheim for yeah. the hot chicks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bootyheim man myself. No, uh, the Thor mythology, though, uh, I know that Ragnarok is their like apocalypse. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. it's basically a loosely version on that. I'm kind of interested to see how they're going to play the Hulk into that storyline, because as far as I know in the, in the Thor storyline, Ragnarok, Hulk never played a part. No. So it seems like they're kind of mashing up Planet sure Hulk with Ragnarok, Ragnarok here. Didn't Ragnarok take place like right after the whole Avengers disassembled? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, that was, that was like the tie-in. That's Jack Kirby. That's yep. definitely, it's definitely Jack Kirby. Right? I was oh, so this say, is deep I, cuts. Ragnarok's a deep cut storyline. I'm yeah. really, I, really, I was really hoping that Goldblum would play Beta Ray Bill. <laughs> Oh, oh my god, that would have been awesome. awesome, but I guess not. I don't know, from what I've heard about the Grandmaster, he seems pretty cool. He's basically an immortal, uh, he's got power cosmic, but he's not quite on the level of Galactus as far as the power level. No, it's, it's one of those things if they're trying to tie in, if you're trying to tie in, I think, the Eternals and the Cosmic Cube and, and trying to get that Thor, it's not about the Thor, the Thanos storyline involved. This is a character you need to have in there along with the collector. I th- yeah, I think so, because you need to establish that there's not only beings that are thousands of years old and have this immense power, but then there's levels of it. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you have the collector type level, then you have Grandmaster, then you, ha- you, you know, your uh, Kree, and then you, you work your way up to like the Thanos level type. Yeah, you, le- you work well, even there's people above Thanos in oh, terms yeah. of this. And so, I mean, Eternals and Beyonders. Yeah, beyonders and, 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 and apparently, what they're doing with Star Lord's father, apparently in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, he's going to be on like Thanos type. Level, yeah. I mean, well, yeah, he's like an eternal, right? Yeah, it's Kurt Russell, or, whoever he's he's playing. But it, the thing is, it's like who they're knows? not doing who Star Wars father in the comics, which I believe is Jason Spartax, Jason yep. Spartax, or whatever. Uh, they're, they're completely doing it, they've created his father to be a Marvel character they want to bring in for Infinity War. Rumors have it as Adam Warlock, some have it as Mr. Oh, Marvel. Who so knows? Awesome. Well, you know, Adam Warlock's cocoon was in the collector's room, that's been yeah, confirmed. That but. was that was that was definitely in there. One thing I do want to point out with Ruffalo and the Hulk, um, if anybody's ever seen this, uh, it was a great animated short that Marvel did called. Uh, it was it was Hulk versus Wolverine, Hulk versus Thor. Oh, that yeah, was a yeah. really really good storyline that happened, where you know the essentially Loki takes over the Hulk's body and goes on a rampage, essentially not only uh, killing, not only just you know destroying Thor in, in terms of that, but he also 
David Banner is all or Bruce Banner at this point in time is trapped in Hell's Realm, and it really, really came out really, really good. And if you, if, I don't know if it's still on Netflix, but take a look for it, and you might get a little key of the plot, key in the idea of what Thor or the role of Hulk is going to be in this. Uh, movie. Now, do you feel a small Easter egg for Ragnarok could have been them mentioning the loss of Hulk and Thor in Civil War? With him asking, do you know where they are right now? Do you see it as Ragnarok has one of those, like, six months ago things where Thor recruits the Hulk, and that's what takes him, and that's why they're no, Like, how do you see the Hulk being recruited how in this do you movie? See, I think Loki takes him, because that's what happens in the Thor, Thor versus Hulk. Loki takes... Well, right now, Loki's on Asgard. He's on as Asgard, Odin. but the idea is, remember, Loki is, as of, uh, as of Thor the Dark World... Thor is on Earth. He suspect he suspects nothing's wrong. He didn't know that Loki was Odin, and so we have this idea that Loki is in Asgard. He can still see into the Earth realm. It's not anything surprising. He and he not, knows the power of the Hulk he as, from having being bashed, you know, bashed <laughs> in the head by, by him. So it's not surprising. But in the in the storyline, what I'm thinking is Loki kidnaps the Hulk because again, the Hulk just mysteriously disappears. They think he's still on Earth, but he may not be. Last rumor in Age of Ultron was that he was off the coast of Fiji. Yeah, it was where they had lost track of him. Now, so just tying into the Marvel world, Iron Fist, which is currently filming on the streets of New York City, Marvel's next venture into the Netflix world, has just confirmed that Carrie Ann Moss will be reprising her role as the Attorney. That we saw in Jessica Jones, which is not surprising. Jerry Hogarth, I, yeah. Jerry Hogarth. I like that they're tying in these characters together. I mean, we've talked about how we wish they would meld it with the, the MCU a little bit, but I like that there's this continuity factor with Rosario Dawson now with Carrie mm-hmm. Ann Moss's character that keep that thread running through them. Now, uh, World has also broken that Defenders and Jessica Jones will film back to back in this December, starting uh, with Defenders first and then Jessica Jones season two. So, what are your thoughts on them doing the back to back filming with these? Makes sense. I'm really excited for it. I loved Jessica Jones very much, and yeah, uh, I know that I'm going to be really excited for Defenders, and I just think it makes sense. Now, with the timelines that I've seen as far as when these shows film to when they wrap to when they air, everything leads me to believe. We know that we're getting Luke Cage September 30th. Uh, with Iron Fist currently about to wrap up, I believe, I would say that we're probably going to get our first December or January Netflix debut with Iron Fist. I think that that's uh, they're gonna, one of the ways they break in the new year will be with the release of Iron Fist. I, I, I'm going to take a guess here. I'm going to say that they don't talk about because you haven't heard any talk about Daredevil season three. Right. So I think they're holding off for that. And you're going to see Iron, Iron Fist in place of Daredevil season three. At least for now. Well, Iron Fist will come before Defenders, so we'll get Luke Cage, then Iron Fist, and that's with the Defenders filming in December. That leads me to believe that we'll get a late summer for the Defenders. So you have the the gap of September to probably July, where the will they debut Defenders and Iron Fist somewhere in the middle there. I think the way mm-hmm. that Marvel typically does this spacing that plots it right. Mm-hmm. I'd say probably Christmas week you yeah. might get Iron Fist. That's a that's a great good possibility. And if that comes true and that happens because there's not a report of that anywhere, I will not let it go unknown. <laughs> so I'm just stamping you my You will scream game. to the mountaintops and the high heavens that you broke it Like first. it's always sunny with Dennis. <laughs> my voice will echo through these halls like the gust of a thousand winds. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a great news. I mean, Marvel seems to really be doing it together. Last casting call in the Marvel Universe we want to acknowledge today that we didn't get to touch on last week. It broke while we were filming. Is that Mike Michael B. Jordan has been cast as the villain in Black Panther. Yep. Reteaming He's him with Creed director Ryan Coogler torch. and bringing him into the Marvel Universe in a role other than the crappy black Johnny Storm. So, guys, wanted to get your thoughts on this. I think it's a great casting. I'd like to see him in the Marvel Universe now in a real role other than that crap fest that was Fantastic Four. So, let's get your take on this one. I can't even talk about Fantastic Four, Four without my blood boiling, but uh, I loved Michael B. Jordan in Creed. He was fantastic he, obviously Kugler saw something in him that he's you know destined for greatness and that's something young director young actor eager to prove himself but they de- they clearly had chemistry together the way that that movie was made and I'm eager to see how that translates into the villainous role here but also with the rumor that the cast is going to be 90% African American I think that all the whitewashing in uh, Hollywood can finally start to cry a little bit with Wonder Woman coming out with the female led cast Black Panther coming out with the African American cast yes they've whitewashed Iron Fist and Doctor Strange as far as the Asians go but I really think that Marvel's trying to take it a little more seriously with the diversity in their mix yeah, the, there there are mo- points in times. Just speak as a person of color. Like it's points in times where you can't not. It's going to be in Wakanda. It's going to be hard given the storyline of Wakanda to have that. The only person that really is there is Everett Ross. 
which is um, Martin Friedman's character. So when you see that come up, he should really be one of the few people that you're going to see. And here's the one thing I will acknowledge I think they need to do. I actually watched Civil War for a third time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the scenes in Wakanda, I hope that they cast the extras a little bit better. Because for a country that's supposed to be in Africa, I have never seen so many white extras in my life. Like touristy people. It was actually kind of shocking. Only the police that I noticed. Some of well, like, the people no, the running first, markets. The first part wasn't in, the first part wasn't in Wakanda. Oh, it was that was Lagos. In, that that was Lagos, Lagos, Nigeria. And so the whole point is when you see that during the end credits, the end credits in there. That's yeah, the, the winter Wakanda. Wakanda. That's, that's the Wakanda, real Wakanda. Yeah. And so you're looking at so it. I, 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 kind of, I, I sat there looking at it. I was like, hey, there's one black person. And there's another black like, person. Yeah, you shouldn't have to count the yeah, amount of black people that are like, supposedly African American. This is the most kids. technologically advanced country in, in the world. world. What? And that, no, that was that was that was the scary part where everybody's like, but they're like, it's Lagos, Nigeria. And then at the again, the end credits. Sorry, spoilers for those who have not seen mm-hmm. Civil War yet. Um, they're in Wakanda, and you see the technology. You see what's going on there. You see what happens with Bucky. They're putting him back under ice, and you're like, oh. Yeah, technically advanced country. Oh, and by the way, can I just l- love the the not only the activation words, but just uh, Baron Zemo's sequence of uh, mission report December sixteenth, nineteen ninety one, have taken off and become hilarious memes. I've seen so many great ones. The best one I saw was great. a girlfriend meme. It was a girlfriend text saying "get home now," and then it was the boyfriend saying "no, I'm out with friends," and then it's her texting the keywords like <laughs> "freight train Russian," and then it just cuts to a picture of the Winter Soldier like running home. My favorite one was a. Uh... It was uh, when she sends you nudes, but That's, you really wanted I posted really that on the Get Your Geek on page <laughs> today. Yeah, that was me. Is uh, when she sends nudes, but instead all you wanted was Mission Report, December 16, 1991. But uh, so taking us out of the last casting news this week, this one just broke as we sat down to cast two. Fargo Season 3 has cast its lead role Lead, lead dual roles, apparently, in Ewan McGregor. Seems Obi-Wan Kenobi himself will be suiting up to play two roles in this season of Fargo. Anthony and I are huge Fargo fans, Robert. I didn't get to take your chance on this before the show. Have you seen either season? I did not get to see the seasons with this one. I was very interested in, see, in seeing it. I just never got around to season it. Season two? Didn't get a chance season to see it. Season one was great. I have, not, I have not got a chance to see this. I heard Martin Friedman was great in the first season. He, he's the stand-up he the first season. The second season was great, but they put in this weird alien element, mm-hmm. and it kind of messes with the end of the show. Like, UFOs mm-hmm. interfere with the climax of the show, which I always find to be. And then no one acknowledges it, mm-hmm. which is another thing. But I'm interested to see what they do with season three. Now, the cool part about this season is the first season took place, obviously, 2015 or 2014, whenever it happened. Second season took place in the 70s with some of the same characters. This third season will take place two years after the first season. So Martin Freeman's character, everyone that was in that will be returning to this as well. So you're going back the time jump to the present, and you'll see the consequences from the first season, which is a little awkward to do that I think weird it's kinda cool. past, present, future jump. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it, we'll see how it goes from there. But that's going to wrap it up for casting call uh, for this week on Get Your Geek On. Next, we're going to move into the rumor mill, which are some uh, movie plots, some storylines, and some releases that are working their way around Hollywood here. Seems to be that we're batting 3-0 and right now as far as the rumor mill goes with our Jeff Goldblum, our Supergirl casting. Uh, but it looks like this week the Harley Quinn solo movie appears to be one of the unannounced DC movies that has been put in production. Uh, for those of you who don't know, two weeks ago DC announced three unknown movie dates uh, and a shift of the Green Lantern movie release date as well. It is long believed now that two of those movies are the Booster Gold movie being written by Greg Berlanti and now the Harley Quinn solo movie. Now this is straight from the mouth of Margot Robbie uh, that she's in final negotiations to sign here. So what are your thoughts on the Harley Quinn solo? I think this is my in the bank I think it's yeah totally well we still haven't the Here's the thing. We still haven't seen Suicide Squad and here's yet. The thing, with the reshoots, I mean, everything I've heard coming out of this movie from everybody on set says that the movie is a mess, the plotline is a mess, but she is the one takeaway from this movie that is, like, the golden girl. Yeah, but it's still, I mean, like, the idea is you're greenlighting something that you don't know. You're greenlighting something that you still don't know what the outcome is before the movie even comes out. And, yeah, I think they got the casting right. Um I would like to see her more involved with the Batman mythos before well, we I get her. I think that that third movie is the solo Batman see, I movie. Really, I think the casting is spot on, but I just, for some, the fan in me just really wish they just cast Tara Strong. 
She's so fantastic. She doesn't. Well, Arlene, the, I mean, she's like too Arlene old. Sorkin. Come on, that let's, was the original. One. Let, let's be real. I mean, she, they're too old. But in the, in yeah, the Hollywood Tara demographic, does not look Margot, old. Margot Robbie is the perky, young, hot, blonde Hollywood actress. No one cares about the fan casting in these movies. If, if that's anything that DC has shown, is that they don't give a damn what the fans think. Yeah. Ezra Miller is a perfect example of that. You see that uh, Tom Cavanaugh actually came out and was like that. on that's the Hollywood Reporter this week, get, criticizing Zack Snyder for not at least seeing Grant Gustin and like testing him for the flash he's like it's ridiculous he's like everything that we've done with this show everything that this kid brings to the role and he's like if you want to have he even says uh, the, the exact quote he's like if you want to have your flash have a mullet and be a slacker that's fine he's like but grant could have done that too yeah, yeah. He, his main point was you know grant's not the flash right he's just acting right like yeah, that's everything that he brings to the role which uh is going to segue us in here a little bit because if there's one thing that we need to talk about on this show it is this week's episode of the flash the flash the flash wow i mean talk about after coming off the heels of what we thought was a great episode directed by Kevin Smith, this episode just threw us right into it. I mean, we knew that there was going to be some consequences and some fallout. I cried like I a dropped girl a tear. Not even going to lie. Henry Allen a was spoiler. Spoiler. If murdered. you haven't seen it, Henry Allen's dead. Our dear departed John Wesley ship left at the hands of Zoom. What tear jerked me is it's not even like having the lost a parent card that I can pull. It was the John Wesley ship as Henry Allen knowing Nailed Zoom it. was going to kill him Nailed and just it. getting out those last words to Barry. Like, no matter what happens, don't let this change you. I love you. Like, I love everything that you've become because everything Zoom is doing is like, I'm going to turn you into me. Which it's, was great because, you know, when Zoom witnessed his parents murdered that it was the exact opposite it, mirrors, it was no please don't no please it mirrors don't the killing joke line to me where the joker says to batman you're only one bad day away from being me it kind of seems like that's what zoom is saying that like you're just one tragic event away from being me and killing his father in his childhood home would be the hope but there has been news grant gustin's come and said that the flash his optimism will stay intact for season three we'll see how that happens but we'll start with the ramifications of henry allen's death this is something he's not dead in the comics he's always kind of been the flash's linchpin as far as his family goes mm -hmm. I mean, what are your thoughts on them taking such a bold move? I, 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 I like it because there is the possibility, spoilers, that we think the man in the Iron Mask is Jay Garrick. I think it's all but confirmed or, at this it's, point. It's Jay Garrick. So it's going to be a form of John Leslie ship as the Flash. You know, hey, guys, the Flash being the Flash again, you know, circa 1990 series, um, is interesting. I, I'm looking forward to when they make that reveal, what I hope is going to be the reveal for that. Here's what I was thinking. This is a theory that I've, just hit me today, in all honesty. Now, we've seen everything that's come forth in the Speed Force visions come true, and the pr producers have said that nothing that's been put in those images won't happen in the show. They're all there for a reason. There are two images that lead me to believe that the John Wesley ship storyline is interesting. One is a callback to the season one finale, which is where you see Barry Allen behind bars talking to his father. Yeah. Now, they said that's going to happen at some point, whether it's on another Earth, anything like that. Mm -hmm. Could it be the John Wesley ship, the Jay Garrick? Is that really his memory of his young son, Barry, behind bars, who was turned dark side? Or the other thing is we've also seen John Wesley ship's flash in his 90s flash uniform and when barry allen asked zoom who's the man in the iron mask he said you wouldn't believe me even if i told you now here's and now stay with me on this we all know that barry knows about doppelgangers and things like that what i think could be truly unbelievable is what if the man in the iron mask isn't john wesley ship as jay garrick what if it's john wesley ship as barry allen from the 90s somehow he took him from time in an alternate that Earth in the 90s, somehow in an alternate Earth in the 90s, Zoom took him, and it's the actual, because we haven't seen the suit, and we the, everything there has been shown. We've seen the Legion rings, we've seen Supergirls. They showed John, they didn't show him as Barry Allen in the 90s, they showed him in the Flash suit. Okay, that would be really, really interesting. It also makes sense, given Mark Hamill's character being from that time as well, and I'd like to see how they pull that off. That's this is an original idea. This is not something that's coming anywhere. This is just me personally thinking because yeah. of the fact that him saying you wouldn't believe me even if I told you, if he had just said, "Oh, it's the real Jay Garrick," or yeah. it's a, a Jay Garrick from another Earth, that's not that unbelievable. But for him to say like it's it's you, it's you from another Earth or from another time, something mm -hmm. like that, some world bending choice like that, mm -hmm. I could see happening. But that's really cool. But Flash, one of the great things they've set up for the season finale here is uh, the army of metahumans that the Flash will have to take down, as well as Zoom himself. Now, there was a moment in this episode where Zoom appeared to open a breach by himself, which is something I wanted to touch on, because Barry himself couldn't even do those. I've heard rumors online saying it's, oh, because he has Barry's powers. Well, but Barry has done it. With Tachyon Enhancement. But that's, like, part of him now. It, no, that's the thing. Tachyon Enhancement is only, like, when you have it, it's a temporary thing. It's like it, Well, it's, it's under his Flash symbol now. 
It's under his floor. No, Zoom doesn't have, Zoom would have to have Tachyon Enhancement in order to open a breach, is what we're saying, because Barry only opened the breach for Tachyon Enhancement. He hasn't done it on yeah. himself yet. The Zoom just... Just Zoom punch, 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 a, hole punch a hole in reality yeah. and was like, hey, I'm going in back. As that alarm well, was They activated. kind of alluded to him having some sort of ability like that, too. When Cisco started opening the breach, Zoom knew it immediately and just went right the, to the I spot. I think there's a tie between the two of them that we're going to see as well, because Zoom has noticed every time Cisco's done something. But I like the fact that they had that go-to weapon of, like, everyone on Earth 2 vibrates at a different frequency, mm. so we can tune it to that and screw with them. So let me also point out something that is Katie Cassidy's probably last time that we, we saw her, she died on Arrow. Spoilers. Boo. Boo. Oh, no, they killed another black canary? You're not... You're kidding. <laughs> they killed Dino Lance. They, 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 they on, kill, on Green Arrow, sure. they killed Dino Lance. So, you have Laurel Lance now. It was kind of nice to see her actually on the show. With a canary cry? The canary they, cry was the, really, awesome. really cool. Now, what do you guys think that, that anything alludes to the blackbirds that Cisco is seeing dropping in his vibes? Uh, it's just an effect of the poles mm-hmm. splitting in half at the end? Yeah. You think this? Now, that leads us into the bigger news here, which has also been announced that next year we will see the four-way crossover of Supergirl, Arrow, Flash, and Legends of Tomorrow. Now, with Supergirl being acquired by the CW, uh, unless the retcon happens, Superman exists in the Flareoverse now, which is something we'll have to acknowledge. But I feel like this crisis event that we may see uh, in the Flash finale here will be a lead to the Crisis on Infinite Earth storyline, which I believe will be the storyline of Season 2. I think the Anti-Monitor will be the villain, and that the Justice Society will have to team up to take them down. I see that crossover as the launch. You're talking point. about the late, you're talking about Legends of Tomorrow. Legends of Tomorrow, Season yeah. 2, they've said that the, the b- villain will be bigger and better than you could have ever imagined. Okay. And I think Anti-Monitor is a great way to set that up. Mm-hmm. I feel like the crossover is the perfect way to launch pad that, because you get everyone together to help them, and then it launches. That'd be and, great, too, because anti Monitor has recently gone through a huge revival in the comics. Yeah, and I like what they've done. I even like what Green Lantern, the animated series, did with them. They had a really cool take on him where uh, they actually had their AI program take him over and like control his body. And she tried to like remake the planet in her own image. It was really cool, but. To see that the fact that all four shows will, in fact, be crossing over is really interesting. And what are your thoughts on this, guys? I mean, we're talking a huge cast of characters now. Well, you're talking a huge cast of characters. Um, it's nice to see Supergirl. We Like we talked about last week, it's great to see Supergirl on a channel where I think she belongs. With writers. That, with writers. You know, they're going, she's, they're going to lose some money on the budget for special and effects. And they may lose Callista Flockhart as well, apparently. She's L.A.-based, and there's Boo-hoo. trepidations about her making the jump, so she may not be a series regular. Mm. Oh, no. Yeah, you know, but I, I was never a Callista before you said I was never a Callista Flockhart fan. I thought she brought a great bit of heart to this show. Like I really liked her character. I like her Cat character Grant. too, but I don't think she's necessary for to have a good Supergirl show. I, I, don't I think, you I need think it Flockhart. is because of the way that the, the chemistry between her and Kara, the way that they balance it off, and the fact that like she knows she's Supergirl and and still plays it off like she doesn't. There's just there's, there's a chemistry between those two that works for a female led series. I feel like you really kind of need her there in that role. It's something that they kind of tried to bring in Channing Tatum's wife in the latter half of the season is Lucy Lane okay, and trying to make yeah. her a more authoritative, more authoritative I honestly role. really just think the whole supporting cast of that show is... But can we acknowledge the fact that not only does Supergirl join the Flareoverse now, we get Martian Manhunter. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Which they hopefully. could do some really cool stuff with him across the show. I see him as being like the Cisco of the show that they can just interchangeably throw on on other shows to help mm. people out with his shape-shifting ability. It really lets him... Well, go it, wherever you want. You know, it's it's it, we're, we're we're gonna have to see when they get to shooting because right now I believe July first uh, we start shooting on. All started, so right now I know the writers are writing, starting to write the scripts for this, and we're gonna have to see what this four this four part crossover, this four show crossover is gonna be. Um, I'm hoping for Crisis on Infinite Earth so that they kind of kind of bring everybody to Earth One or maybe not Earth One, maybe this is Earth Prime. We don't know. That'd be awesome. You know, <laughs> a merging of all the Earths. Yeah, yeah, like emerging, which would make sense to me because that's a great way to bring Supergirl that's, into the that's, I think is what we're all going to speculate here is how they're going to do the retcon of bringing Supergirl to the Arrowverse because as far as we know right now in, in the show's universe she exists on Earth 3 yeah. which is something that they've not touched on in any of the other shows but they know that they're going to be bringing her so that it will be Earth 1 it'll be three. It'll be Starling City Central City National City mm-hmm. which could they be more lame with the Coast City like well okay this is DC this is the DC universe we're talking about you know um, but at least Marvel is set in real places. Yeah, it, it, well, for the mo- it, it is, but it's like, it, it is, but it isn't. They want to have recognizable places like Coast City, might be Los Angeles. 
you know, or it's sunny or Metropolis. Well, DC is, makes their universes so small. Like on the show, yeah, they say it's like 600 miles between Starling City and Central City, but who knows what they do in National City now? And even with the Batman vs. Superman, making Gotham and Metropolis across the bay from each other that makes was, the Marvel, the, the DC yeah. universe you so small. See, so you tell me 90% of the DC universe occur, occurs in like a mile yeah. island the you size of Manhattan? Something the else. Bat so, signal from the Daily Planet. Well, it's, <laughs> that, that's why I always thought the plausibility. It's like, what, you know, oh, the Bat signal's up. What? But um, Superman's character doesn't, you know, doesn't see that, hey, the bat signal's up. Who's that guy? He doesn't have any idea of Batman's versus you're bringing up bad memories. Let's go back to the thing. One thing I do want to bring up that we didn't talk about before was Krypton. Are you talking about the sci-fi pilot? The sci-fi pilot. Yeah, which takes it, which follows, it's the grandfather, right? It's uh, Jarrell's father. Yeah. Yeah, which I, it's been greenlit by, basically it's a prequel series set on Krypton featuring uh, Superman's father, Jorel's father, basically the start of the destruction of Krypton and him trying to prevent it and... Sounds totally going, pointless. It, I, I'm interested to see it. There's not, it, Krypton's one of those weird things like the, the Jesus years, as they call it with things, where like Jesus has that gap from 11 to 33. There's not a whole lot with Krypton that we know. They've you gone back. Know and done things it's with because Kandor. on Krypton, all the Kryptonians are just like us. They're regular people on Krypton. They're well, just smart. You know what? And I, I like that's the one thing is it's a show without superpowers. But steering in the way of DC TV, and this is going to really this is like my what grinds my gear segment. And I'm sorry, guys, I'm throwing this one at you now on the outline. Uh, for those who don't know, the trailer for Powerless drops. The show we had talked about last week, mm-hmm. the oh, DC yeah. insurance comic show. Trailer looks great. I love the comedy fact of it. What really, really pissed me off about this show is. In the course of a two-minute trailer, they name drop Wonder Woman, Superman, and Green Lantern. They think one of their coworkers is the Green Lantern. You're telling me in a series that no one has seen yet, you'll connect Green Lantern and Wonder Woman, but in three seasons of The Flash, two seasons of The Flash, and three seasons of Arrow, you can't mention one of them? You can't name They're drop any? It. Like, it just blows my mind think, that that's what you can connect them to I in your like, mind? I feel like Powerless is more like based in the comic universe. But it, it just blows my mind. Goofier. Like to hear Green Lantern in the trailer as the Green Lantern fan that was hoping for Alan Scott last night on Legends of Tomorrow, like it broke my soul. I'm like, this is what you guys will name drop Green Lantern for, but well, you won't be put happy him you'll get it. I'm gonna get it in 2020. Well, like you might all get you it Marvel fanboys, you have everything. Like with the exception of like the uh, the one Doctor Strange fan that's been rooting for 20 years for a movie to be made. All the big heroes are made now: Superman, Batman, Iron Man, Thor, Hulk. I got a murder movie in Green Lantern, like a snuff film, basically that I had to sit through for an hour and 20 minutes, and that's the only thing that I have. It's like it's my Special Olympics gold medal winning little brother. It's like <laughs> yeah, I love him, but. Let's be real. Like, he's never going to not live in my parents' basement. And that's what that movie is. That movie's never going to be revered. 20 years from now, they're not, there's no hipsters going to be like, you don't find the subtleties in Green Lantern, man, like I do. No, that movie was horrible. So I have to wait five years for my reboot. Everybody else gets their chance now. But anyway, that was just my little gripe about Powerless. Just wanted to transition us a little bit here into one of our new segments here. Robert? Polist? Yes, which is going to be the polis, and this is basically what we're taking a look at new in the comics world each and every week. Uh, With the three of us here, Anthony tends to be a little bit more of an indie and a Marvel guy. Robert seems to be hardcore Marvel with a little DC in him, and then I am DC to the core, my friends. I know, like, the major Marvel storylines, I go back to about 1990 on my Marvel knowledge. I think I bounce around pretty evenly between the three big I just like what DC's doing now. Now, one thing we did want to mention is by the time this episode airs, it'll be the day before DC's rebirth. Next week's episode, we are going to have a Facebook exclusive segment that's going to be talking about all about DC's rebirth. We're going to review it, what our thoughts are on what it's going to be as far as lining up with the new DC universe, as far as the redesign of the Joker. We'll have the reveal of the Joker's name by next week's episode. That's dropping in Green uh, Justice League number 50, which is revolutionary news. But basically, just want to take a look at what you guys are reading, anything you've heard about that's coming out that you want to check out. And we know some of the fans here are comic nerds. So, Anthony, what is on your poll list this week? It was a really light week for me this week. Um, I basically basically got Wonder Woman 52, which I haven't read Wonder Woman since Brian Azzarello dropped off the book, but I wanted to see how it all wrapped up, and it didn't really disappoint me. Not a big fan of the Finches, but uh, <coughs> excuse me, I think they did a pretty good job tying everything up. The only other two books that I got this week were uh, 
Spider-Man issue number four, which is a continuation of Ultimate Spider-Man with Miles Morales mm. by Brian Michael Bendis. And I love that they brought Sarah him Pichelli. into the current Marvel Universe he's and great. he's not this Ultimate Spider-Man he's great. anymore. I love he's Miles Morales. Few, like, I, I hate the minority character syndrome where they're always like, oh, let's just reboot this guy with a minority and that'll bring new interest to it. And Miles Morales is the one character I feel like that transcended that Miles Morales' storyline was unique, his character was unique, and I oh, really worried when he I heard the, about He was the glue of the Well, he was the one character I was worried yeah, about, universe. I should say. When I had heard that the universes were merging and there was no longer going to be the ultimate universe he was the one character i was worried about I was like oh miles well, morales only, is like, awesome. i think only three people really survived it it was uh miles and his supporting cast and the maker who is ultimate reed richards I now do you guys think we'll ever get a miles morales on screen yeah, eventually. I mean, that was what people were pulling for when they when uh, Donald Glover. I remember it was well, like yeah, Donald Glover fans. like was one of those. But when they when they were really pulling for it, um, when the last movie, the last Amazing Spider Man movie, kind of tanked and uh, Marvel was taking over, they were hoping to say maybe this is the time for Mar- Mar- Miles Morales, and we got. God, and Brian Michael Bendis had a really great run on that, and I really like what Have he you did read with, the Spider Men one that yeah. he did where they yeah. team up. I've yeah. read almost yeah. every issue of anything that has ever come out in the Ultimate Marvel brand. Yeah. Did you read the Ultimates? I now, is it true? I read. <laughs> Can you confirm? I read the Ultimates one. I read the Ultimates two. I read the Ultimates three, and then you know, I've read. I've See, read them all. I like the idea. I like about that. One of the things, just to quickly digress, was that he he brought new life to characters. So he made sure. Kitty, he made Kitty Cat, Kitty Pride's character. And she was great. great Jones. In that uh, cloak and dagger. I love Jessica the, Jones. Was, he did uh, Alias. Brian Michael she, Bendis did Alias. Did Brian Michael Bendis did Alias. Um, but. Jessica Jones in the Ultimate Universe was just a kid in Peter's class okay. that had a crush on him. Now, the yeah. two of you that know Ultimates, Robert, I'm sorry to cut you up. Just real quick, can you confirm, remember, is it true that Nick Fury was drawn as Samuel Jackson yep. in the Ultimate yep. Universe they and then they cast it. him yep. because of it? They talk about it in the okay. in the Ultimates. They're talking about who would play them in a movie. Uh, that's all I wanted to know. Yeah. Robert, what were you saying? No, I, I like what Byron Michael Bendis did in the Ultimate Universe because he... Um, but do you like what Mark Millar did in, <laughs> in the Ultimate <laughs> Universe? Because I know the answer is a no, yeah, but I'm right like, there with you. It's a lot of his characters came to life, and like you know, we talk about Miles Morales. So I was really happy about uh, again because Cloak and Dagger is a show that was the thing that Marvel was looking to do on, I guess the the Family Channel or whatever the rebranded they've just done recently. Freeform the ABC Freeform. family. They're looking to come out with a Cloak and Dagger, and I love how he reinvented those characters, um, particularly because I had grown up with them, grown up with them, and the run they were the last good time they saw them was in the Runaways a while, a long, long time ago. But I really like what Brian Michael Bendis did. It was with that. So can we good just to stop and say Spider-Man Runaways? Again. Like, can that be the one Marvel property that gets to? De- That's the one thing that like drew me into Marvel in the early two thousands when Runaways K. first Bond hit. Book, right? Dude, the first volume of Runaways is a near perfect comic yeah. book storyline, in my opinion. The, the whole premise of a, ki- a group of kids that find out their parents are like the world's most dangerous supervillain team, and then basically team up to stop their own parents. I thought that was insane. Mm-hmm. They twisted the storyline over over various volumes, but that first volume, yeah. like I will hold up to almost anything in the comic book. No, it was, it was a like, really interesting storyline, and I, again, there was that one. I think it was a one off, uh, a one off where they had cloak and dagger in it, and it was just. In the ultimate, Run, no, the runaways. Oh, in the runaways. In the runaways. That oh. was a Brian K. Vaughn book, I believe. I'm yeah, sure. Now, was, on my poll list, I keep mostly DC, uh, which wrapped up this week with Wonder Woman two. My wrap up was the Sinestro series wrapped up at uh, issue twenty two, which I really thought was strong. They gave him his own series, and he really held it very well. There was like some Colin great storylines right? that carried out well, uh, but two. Issues that I picked up this week, actually three, based on movies and TV shows coming out because we want to be able to review them, is Black Panther number one, which is actually becoming the hottest selling awesome. comic out there right now, yep. according to uh, Anthony. It's true. So that could be true. It could be, oh, we'll hold it, but to Anthony. And then uh, Preacher number one and Outcast number one. Yeah. With uh, both those pilots, the Outcast pilot actually leaked. I'll be watching that when I get home. I didn't tonight. like Outcast when I read it. it. Just seemed like Robert Kirkman's Constantine. It's one of those things. It's one of those things. Like I'll read the first couple issues just to see how loosely based a show is. Like sure. with Preacher, I hear nothing but good things about Preacher. Preacher's so it's awesome. one that might delve a little bit harder. Are either of you guys familiar with the Preacher storylines? Yeah, really, so that's something we should really like. Work. That's, you that's should that's definitely something. give it a shot. It's really, is really it a show good. that you think we should like consider reviewing. Absolutely. On Absolutely. Once it's on. Absolutely. I think because I, I do like um, Dominic, is it? Because he plays Howard, a young Howard Stark. This is the other. Oh, man, I can't remember his name. Dan, uh, Sebastian. No, it's not Sebastian Stan. 
I get those guys mixed up. Dominic, wait, Dominic Cooper. Sebastian Dominic Stan, Cooper, just completely yeah. off note. Have you guys seen those friggin' memes of him photoshopped as, Mar- as Mark Hamill's Luke Skywalker? Yeah, he looks great. How insane would that do? You want to talk about your young casting. There yeah, you go right casting. there. But uh, So, yeah, that's going to do it for the poll list. Now we just want to run through a quick set of Hollywood headlines breaking today as we get right to shoot. Looks like the Assassin's Creed movie will be based on the Apple of Eden storyline from uh, the Assassin's Creed Syndicate video game. Really cool storyline, basically about an artifact that controls the history of time and can be manipulated. Really cool. We'll see how that goes. As we said, the Outcast pilot leaked this week, so we'll be sure to check that out and get it back to you. And big news around the rumor mill in Hollywood headlines is that courtesy of a video from a theater in Venezuela, it looks like we have the title for Episode 8, Star Wars. Looks like the title is Fall of the Resistance. Uh, it comes from a pretty reliable source of the Eurocon poster. Uh, this isn't one of those fake Photoshop things that you've seen. Eurocon will be next month in Venezuela. It's typically where they uh, do the big Disney announcements. So it looks like that this poster has some credence. With that being said, if it does turn out to be true, what are you guys' thoughts on the title of this movie? Right now, this movie is like, they got to find those holes and plug them. Not that to say that, because there's so much that's coming out about uh, about uh, Poe Dameron's character, uh, played by Oscar Isaac. I didn't hear uh, anything about that. Dude, oh, no. it's bad. Like, I have a it's, friend that lives in Ireland, and they're filming, like, yeah. maybe two, three miles from his house, and he's posting, like, grainy photos. and Like, they're having a hard time keeping this one. Like, it's not like episode seven. What's the rumor seven. about Poe? Uh, he's going to have a larger role, and then Laura Kinney's character and him, are, they have this kind of adversary relationship. So wherever we pick up in the film, when... Um, well, no, I'm sorry, not Laura, not Kent, Laura, Laura, Laura Dern's character. And whenever we pick up in the film where that is, it's going to be this adversary relationship where you're going to see more out of him and have him be kind of become a different person. Well, they're the reason for the... Re- you guys know that, right? The reason for the delay in the movie was the rewrite in the script of the popularity of Captain Phasma and Poe. Because Poe died in the original version of the Star Wars Awakening script. He dies when the when they crash land on the planet. Mm. He was out, and the test response with, to his character, like... Well, he's great. ...had yeah, them write really him back him in. But he was dead in all original scripts, and then they actually delayed the movie because of the fan reaction to his character and um, Gwendolyn Christie's have you read Captain the, Phasma. Uh, so, yeah, they're going to be way Have you read roles. the Marvel comic that bridges... It takes place right after Return of the Jedi. It's one of the first. I don't like, read Star Wars books. comics. Oh, they're awesome! I don't. I only go see Star oh, Wars movies awesome. for lightsaber fights. The uh, mm. the Star Wars comic books have been great if you're a Star Wars fan. But they uh, they had one called The Journey to the Force Awakens, which um, had to do with Luke kind of cleaning up his mess after Return of the Jedi, and it was him um, with Poe Dameron's mother. And they recover from the one of the Empire's factories. They recover the last living. A tree from a temple of a Jedi and he cuts it in half and he gives her half of it and she plants it in her front yard and the last page of the book is her holding a baby Poe and they're like playing in the yard next to the tree which mm-hmm. I thought was really awesome yeah see I'm not a big fan of the comic tie-ins because I, they never get acknowledged so I feel like they're kind of pointless stories yeah I, I mean there's been there's some, been some good stories recently Jason Aaron writes them very yeah, well there's some, been some really good stories I think one of the more interesting ones is um, have you heard the, read the one about how C-3PO gets his red arm? That, yeah, that one I shot was, that. That, that, was, really that was really, really, was really tragic. Good. Too. And the yeah. traitor storyline with uh, Finn and the, the stormtrooper he fights. And I like the uh, I like the Vader down crossover. I thought it was really neat. But a uh, slight storyline change. We just want to throw our support to the Kansas City couple that was arrested for having sex during a screening of Batman versus Superman. Well done. We feel you. You needed something to do in that movie, so you turned <laughs> to the only thing you had, and unfortunately, you got busted for it. So that's going to be all we'll touch on with that. Uh, casting call was confirmed as far as when Anthony and I sat down, looks like uh, the talks are not only back on, but the deal is signed for Michael Keaton to be the vulture in Spider-Man Homecoming. So it looks like they got away from it, tried to come back to him, got away again, and now he is the back. Guy just so can't put that down leads the me wings, to believe huh? the story reports that I've read online are true, that it will be the vulture and the tinkerer as the two villains in this storyline, mm. and it will involve the vulture wanting... First of all, the vulture's suit will be made out of harvested pieces of Chitari armor from the Battle of New York. Awesome. That will be reverse engineer technology from that, and there will be... Uh, Norman Osborn will not only have watched over Spider-Man and know of his existence the entire time at the end of the movie, he'll be revealed as the villain, but it appears the Vulture will want Spider-Man for his blood. His blood has regenerative properties that the Vulture is trying to use to de-age himself along with his technology. So that's the reason why he wants Peter Parker. We also heard the rumor that they might cast um, 
or not cast, but they might add Wilson Fisk as that, the kingpin. Yeah, that to was the breaking a deadline movie. today. Is that there's talks of bringing him into the... just the thought of that makes me happy. See, I don't, yeah, I that don't even... that would be good because again, for me at this point in time, I want to see the tie-in. They have to find ways to you've, tie that. In. You've built it up. You're at the point now where if Luke Cage doesn't have some sort of significant tie-in, you might lose a bit of that audience because yeah. then you'll be three series, thirty episodes well, in, well, and no major references. You no know, major references, and even outside of that, now we're talking about you know. The idea is of look at what happened on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. with the Inhumans. Marvelous. Which Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. such a disappointing finale. Really? Yeah, well, I mean, they killed off the people they needed to kill off, but at the same time, you're like... Really? You thought Lincoln needed to... I thought it would have been Mac. Like, they weren't doing Inhuman. anything with his character. But I just like that actor. He was on The Tomorrow People, which yeah. was a show that got canceled that I loved as well, so it's like he can't say on anything. But the, uh, but the idea is that you look at what they're doing, and I think they're trying to say, like, look, we need to find ways to start merging this. And I've been saying it for weeks. They need to find ways to start merging these universes together. Otherwise, it's not going to make sense. My yeah. dream scene in any, of the, in any of the MCU things, I just want to see... Uh, Nur- Murdoch and Nelson. I want to see Foggy go open up the shade to the window, and Spider Man's just there with his price, his face pressed up against the window, just going, "Oh, hey, Magoo, can I use your bathroom?" That's all <laughs> I want to see. I just want to see almost like some Legends of Tomorrow like moment with the Avengers, where like he calls in Daredevil, and there's a rooftop scene of the Defenders with like Tony Stark saying, "Like, listen, I know that you guys are like scrappers and this and that, but this is why we're bringing you in." Because if Infinity, we know that that's going to be Infinity War. It's just it's all speculation until we get there. Oh. And we totally skimmed right over this, but the Legends of Tomorrow finale was this week too. We didn't yeah, oh, really yeah, the talk introduction much about of that. Our yeah. Man. Yeah, there was the Which, introduction of the Our most Man. disappointing introduction in comic book history. I yeah. was at home salivating. And hey, I guess we're having the same cast next year, minus Hawk Girl, My, minus no, the Hawks. And several new additions. Uh, Hawk Girl's gone. Hawk Man is gone. I just want to um, see Firestorm go back to the other shows. Rumor is Cisco comes over as Vibe, and then we've talked about some of the other cat Vixen, who they have uh, in their in their staff. How cool bring her was over. it to watch Firestorm transmute? Something. Finally, finally, Firestorm so transmute. He doesn't have full control over it, but the yeah. final it, 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 it's a story point where he has to transmute. He transmutes an exploding or asteroid into and water. He tr- yeah, transmutes yeah. it into water. Like, I've lost my mind at that point because so cool. in the first season with Robbie Amell, they had a scene where he did it, but they cut it out for budget reasons. He turned a thermometer into a rose for Caitlin, and they had cut it out, and they were like, oh, we don't know when we're going to be able to bring that power back in. So awesome. But it was it was really cool to see that, so that's I'm looking forward pa- to that. That's like his main power. Basically, it ended, for Robert, who didn't watch it, is that the Time Masters are destroyed, the Oculus, which is how they see through time, is destroyed, so Rip Hunter and the legends that are left are the new Time Masters, so they're going to be patrolling the timeline and making sure that yeah. crap so isn't it funny that Mick Rory Heatwave is a time is the master. leader. Is the leader. Like <laughs> yeah. he's the one that sends our man. You find out at the end of the finale. And there's this awesome moment where they send him back to talk to to Wentworth and others. Captain Snart, where he gets to tell him like you were my best friend and you're a better dude. But, but Les Robert and I talked with with Wentworth Miller starring across all four shows. How are they going to explain that point? Well, not death? even that. He did. He did Prison Break. Well, I there's mean, this. Uh, well, there's this huge emotional death scene for him in Legends of Tomorrow, where great. it's like you first think it's Rip Hunter's going to die, and then Adam pulls him out, and he's like, No, it's going to be me. I'm going to die. And then Captain Cole pulls him out at the last minute and, and bites the bullet. But it's like, how are you going to basically negate that? Which was such a big plot point of the well, show. I mean, he was sucked into, like, or he either exploded or he was sucked into, like, the nexus of time. So he could be spit out so somewhere. So it could be anything, yeah. yeah he, I mean, nobody knows what this... The good thing about the CW, or at least the DC on television, um, minus Gotham... Um, they they were are more than happy to pull out whatever cards like you know you think that character's dead no they're Lazarus not pit. <laughs> suck it yeah but now they didn't they even get rid of that in Arrow but that, that's gone. The, that's the one that they, they got rid of it they got rid knows? of it but doesn't mean they can't find another, another one and also super alternative. Goes so I think that that's going to wrap things up one thing that we did want to add and it's hey you know what we are geeks we are you know friends and everything else like that but we're people too so this is a what's new with you segment just basically give you guys a heads up what's new with us what's going on in the outside world when we're not here podcasting me this week big news coming out of my world I landed my dream job as an associate manager at the AMC theater near me as somebody that knows me movies are my thing it is my world and to be working there is great for me also in the middle of planning a wedding with my beautiful fiance Eva, who will be featured, I'm sure, at some point. She's Hi, one Eva. of our assistants at Cons. Hello. Hi, Eva. We know you're not listening, but don't worry. Thank and then, God. Uh, yeah, so things are going great for me. Robert, obviously, is one of the masterminds here at BevCam, where we shoot everything. Things could not operate here without him. He's also the reason that we have this podcast. But, Robert, what goes on in your outside world? Yeah, what's oh, up with you, buddy? Your secret outside, identity. What secret do you do? Identity. Well, not really. I do another podcast with my roommate, um, who is an opera singer, which is always interesting. If you ever check it out, we're on Mixed Cloud called Fads. 
Plug it. Uh, we uh, we talk about geeky things because he's a gamer like myself. He's also uh, we also talk about pop culture references. And so it's the Fred and Doke show. And if you're looking for it, you can find us on Mixcloud. Um, and we'll be sure to link everything on the Facebook the pages what? as well. Fred and Doke show. Cool. And as always, you can check Anthony out on his Hype Train podcast that he's heading to film right after he leaves here. But Anthony, yep. other than that, what is your secret identity like in the real world? Oh, man, I've been doing a lot of work. I have been reading a lot of old back issues of comic books. I just crushed through uh, Alias by Bendis and Gatos and uh, its sequel, The Pulse. Which I thought was really awesome. Yeah, that's really good. I was going to say for some of the things I've been reading, I've been going back and reading some old Image slash Wildstorm comics. Oh, awesome! No, I love. What, we're going to have to talk Wildstorm in next week's episode because that is one of my favorites. But uh, Anthony, you just landed a job this week yourself as well. Mm-hmm. And what was that? Uh, working for Nerdorama Network. That's right. Our newest field correspondent, convention reporter, and show host himself will be taking the Hype Train podcast over to Nerdorama, so make sure you check there out all the links below for everything. But, Anthony, that's not all you do. You're a man of many talents, so tell yeah, us. Yeah, uh, well, you know, uh, musician. i got some new music that's coming out soon. Everything can be found on my Facebook page, which is just Anthony Arsenio Rama. Um, got new season of Hype Train podcast, which is coming out, and doing a lot more interesting things with that. Got some audio plays coming out. I'm writing a uh, old 20s detective story uh, that's coming out soon. We already did one, but this is the sequel. Um, and as always, you can be found on the retro review segments with us here on the video segments for Facebook, and every week here on the Get Your Geek On podcast. Anything else you guys want to get out there today? Oh, you can don't forget you can listen to start listening to the Get Your Geek On podcast that on the Bedcam right. Bedcam Podcast Network starting on Monday. So make so sure. you will be able to hear it on iTunes Hey-o. and SoundCloud. And SoundCloud. Big news, folks! Big yeah. big things. And we want to thank you to everybody that tuned in. Uh, we had a huge explosion in our viewership last week, so we know that there's people out there courtesy of Nerd Herder. We do and love Nerd you. We do love you guys we do love your feedback everything has been positive coming at us so far which i love so we want to thank you all the listeners but for this week's episode of get your geek on i'm your host charles Kiwatts. i'm robert dokes anthony arsenio keep it geeky and we'll see you at the movies have a good one guys get your freak on.